the United States has a long, paradoxical, perhaps even perverse, relationship with the occult. No states better show this than the witch-haunted forests of Old New England, the birthplace of American horror tradition. Since Europeans first came to America, and even before then, the New England woods have been seen as uniquely cursed. For such small parcels of land, Rhode Island, Connecticut, Massachusetts, Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine have had a none too overstated impact on the imagination of the United States. It is no surprise then, deep within the wilds of New England, one can literally find Satan's kingdom. Seriously. Not one, but three Satan's kingdoms. Okay, two Satan's kingdom in Massachusetts and Vermont, and a Satan's kingdom in Connecticut. Three pieces of public land apparently subject to the Prince of Darkness himself. Now, good Christian viewers may be asking, is there something actually satanic here? Beside edgy teenagers, there is no occult activity in these oddly named locales. If anything, the use of Satan's kingdom as a title in New England is the opposite of sacrilege. The strange name is a remnant of the darkness, violence, and fear that hovered over New England in the days of the Puritan. The English, religious colonists of the Northeast whose fears, fetishes, and failures serve as the bedrock of the lineage of American horror. Ever so inclined to the Old Testament, Puritans marked New England's geography with warnings of the devil's dire influence over the mortal world. Among the hostile wilds of the New World, the Puritans literally believed the forest, full of unchristian Indians and witches, was Satan's kingdom. The devil was out there, tempting and testing them on the uncharted frontier. The image of the black-clothed, steeple-hatted Puritan is one of the oldest and longest debated images in the United States. It is no surprise the modern idea of the Puritan is exaggerated in some respects, but it is also truer than most would think. It is through the pen of Nathaniel Hawthorne, and later Horace's successors, the black-clad Puritan descends to us. The Puritan that still haunts New England as much as, apparently, the devil himself. Both linger on in the colloquial oddities in the Northeast. The several Satan's kingdoms in America date back to the Puritans' own fear of the dark. If the Puritans were so open to Satanic geography, why did their name become synonymous with Killjoy? Now, the Puritans were dour reformists in some respects, but their modern image stems from American author Nathaniel Hawthorne's interpretation. Hawthorne's tales of colonial New England explored the dark, psychological guilt of the Puritan Commonwealth due to a complicated relationship with his own Quaker-whipping witch-branding ancestors. A rather unsavory side of the Puritans. Hawthorne's twice-told tales, Mosses from an Old Mainz, and The Scarlet Letter explored the failures of Puritan starkness but became as permanent as his own bloodline's cursed place in American history. Hawthorne's New England became the basis of American Gothic horror, and the Puritan its symbol. This shame-haunted New England became the popular understanding of the Puritan, but the Puritan is a far more complicated figure in historical retrospect. The Puritans were not as miserable as commonly thought. Puritan society did allow far more indulgence than most would assume. Things such as hunting, drinking, and sexual pleasure within marriage, were allowed to moderation. Those who overindulged were subject to the notorious powers of social shaming in 1600s New England, and sometimes even legal punishment. This social shaming was to guarantee conformity. While the image of the black-clad Puritan is not totally incorrect, Puritan clothes were usually in sad colors, such as browns, dark greens, and russets that rejected all vanity. Brighter reds and blues were to be kept below darker outwear as to prevent envy. The reason for this uniformity was due to the Puritan theological understanding of society as a single whole organism. If any part of society was in disorder, in danger, or disconnected, that put the whole at risk. Puritan elders believed only a unified, self-regulating society could tame the New World. It was, as they understood it, the duty of the English colonists to transform this wilderness into a garden. Strict Puritan social control was to embody this ordered society. Puritan churches had complete control over public morality. Puritans believed in a far different concept of freedom and liberty than what would later become identified with America. Freedom was only the power to follow God and be saved, if God allowed, while liberties were only granted by person. Beside the power of belief, which guaranteed one a place in society, the Puritans believed in no inborn natural rights. 
Too much liberty puts society in danger. No one could live on their own for danger they would fall into temptation. Nor could anyone live too far away from society lest they begin to indulge in unnatural liberty. It was a very Old Testament understanding of the world based on punishment. The Puritans themselves constantly under threat by starvation, raids, and, as they saw it, the supernatural. The wilderness of New England existed to tempt away colonists from the true path, and punish them for their sins. Everything outside society was unnatural. The Puritans did truly believe in the supernatural too. Magic was as real as the Bible because, well, magic was in the Bible. The Puritans were a highly literate, but also a highly superstitious lot. They thought there were mermaids off the coast of Maine and unicorns beyond the Hudson River. The devil was known as the Black Man, for being literally midnight black, and he wandered the woods offering awful deals to the Puritans. Those who took it were condemned to hell. Everyone knows the witch trials of 1692 and 1693, but fears of the supernatural regularly rippled across New England. Whenever Puritan society came under threat, fears in the supernatural flared up. The violence of infrequent Indian conflict, both raids and battles, led to endless rumors among the colonists. From the start of the prolonged Native American conflict in King Philip's War in 1675, to the end of the Nine Years' War in 1697, reports of lithobolia, or rock throwing, were common across New England. Claims the devil himself had caused rocks to be thrown at people. All likely hysteria, but to ward off these dark powers, the Puritans set up spirit stones at the edge of towns. Engraved rocks used to defend against Satan's dark magic at work in New England. Forests were synonymous with the devil and witchcraft. All misfortune in New England was usually blamed on Satan's dominance in the unchristian woods, a situation Puritan scholars described as the wilderness condition of the colony. Everything from natural disasters such as plague, pestilence, and bad winters, to human error such as ship sinkings, warfare, and banditry, were blamed on the natural disorder of the wilderness. Night too was greatly feared, for it was when Satan's power was at its greatest in the world. Puritans would rush home at sunset to avoid being caught outside at night. Beside Indian raids, the wild beasts of New England, and robbers, many were afraid the devil, or his minions, attacked at night. The dark woods were, after all, the natural habitat of the devil. Civilized society was identified as inherently Christian. As the devil tempted people through sin, he also tempted Puritan society through the sensual liberty of the woods. Anyone who came into contact with the wilderness, or Native American society, the Puritans believed, was liable to be infected by it. This disorder was a contagion that could spread through and endanger New England. The freedom of the wilderness subverted the civil order, the danger to reject the strict mission of the colonies. Every part of Puritan society was predisposed to search for any infraction, as it was the sign of the devil, no matter how minor. While the purpose of the Puritan mission was to convert the Native Americans, they stood in total opposition to Native American society. This may seem strangely hypocritical as no leniency was given to the native tribes of New England. The Puritans though believed their society was ordered by God, and any deviancy would cause God to abandon or destroy it outright. As it goes, New England was to be a city on a hill. An example for society above all others the Puritans saw as inherently corrupt. This is why Native American conflict ossified Puritan theology and philosophy to such an extreme opposition of, as the Puritans described it, wasteland, desert, or wilderness, in concept. The Puritan magistrate Nicholas Noyes warned that New England had to be a habitation of justice to convert the pagan Native Americans, or else America in total would become the headquarters of Gog and Magog, servants of the Antichrist and the Apocalypse. The preacher and Puritan elder, Cotton Mather, was far more optimistic. Once Puritan Christianity, and thus to the Puritan civilization, spread westward to overcome the lands of the Antichrist, Mather declared, The brave countries and gardens would fill the American hemisphere, would be the holy city in America, a city the street whereof will be pure gold. Obviously a metaphorical statement in service of a sermon, but the intent was very literal. Early diplomacy between the Puritans and Native Americans was more often than not defined by mutual amity, if not outright friendship. If not simply for the fact most tribes trusted the English more than the Catholic French and Jesuit missionaries. The Puritans too condemned Jesuit missionary efforts as weak, and believed the natives had to come over to Christianity by their own will, a core tenet of Puritan theology even for European colonists. It would be the complex interplay of disease and politics though that would destroy this link between the two societies. The field of tribal politics in 1600s New England was not a monolithic entity. 
The alliances between the Wampanoags, Nipmunks, Narragansetts, and Pequots, among others, shifted constantly between each other and the European empires, an issue not helped by different concepts of land rights and the impact of disease on native communities. The issues, far too many to discuss here, boiled over into King Philip's War in 1675, a conflict so unprecedented in violence the colonists believed it was the actual apocalypse. A fear amplified by the natives' tactical supremacy in the war, Metacomet, King Philip's, forces had the advantage of camouflage and familiarity with the forests and swamps of New England in battle. The English rejected camouflage and sneak attacks as unchristian. The guerrilla warfare of the New World was an unfamiliar, often fatal, field of strategy. It felt as if they were literally at war with the forest itself. The Puritans often shot each other on accident, and according to Nathaniel Sultanstall, thought of their enemies as being like wolves and other beasts of prey. The conflict was won by the colonists only due to numerical superiority and Metacomet's own strategic failures, a long war where massacre was answered with massacre. While the violence of King Philip's War was mostly concluded with the Treaty of Casco Bay in April 1678, the mental scar upon New England would become perpetual. The term Satan's Kingdom was now fully justified and in vogue in the Puritan dialect. The wilderness truly was a place of natural danger. Though as the interior of New England became settled by the inland towns along the Connecticut River, the native population, already in decline, faltered due to the war and disease, and land for settlement became more plentiful, New England seemed far less wild by the 1700s. As the dangers of the frontier faded, so too did the fear in the actual devil. Satan's kingdom became a less catch-all term. The name was exclusively used in reference to places of natural danger like treacherous rivers and woods. By the 1800s, the phrase became another form of biblically-based slang, a fire and brimstone term to warn believers away from dangerous areas, or places people just did not like. Unfortunately, Satan's kingdom was a common turn of phrase throughout the United States in the 1800s. This makes finding out why these locations retained the name hard to find. Conjecture, based off Puritan origins, is somewhat necessary in this case. Not that New England has any lack of odd or biblically named towns. The many Salem's, Bethlehem's, Lebanon, Jericho, Canton, Massachusetts is actually named for Canton, China, and Braintree is named for Braintree in England, and nobody has any idea about that one. What is interesting about Massachusetts and Vermont's Satan's Kingdom is their strange grammatical construction, what could act as a clue to their origins. Both lack a possessive apostrophe despite seeming to imply possession. These areas are Satan's, after all. While it could simply be an error, it seems to imply the two locations were named before standardized grammar, an obvious clue to the pre-standardized grammatical structure of the 17th and 18th centuries. Unless, of course, they mean there are multiple Satans in the kingdom. Spooky. The actual reasons for these names, though, are probably rooted in local folklore. None of the three Satan's kingdoms are highly populated, so their history will be obviously obscure. The simplest, Satan's Kingdom, is the unincorporated community located in Leicester, Addison County, Vermont. Even by the American Revolution, Vermont was not heavily settled, so Puritan name origins are unlikely here. The town of Leicester was not chartered until 1761, settled in 1773, and only organized in 1786 after the American Revolution. Satan's Kingdom, Vermont, was apparently named as such for bad soil either by farmers as a warning to other farmers, or by a landowner who was swindled. He bought the land believing it to be prime property, but abandoned it when he found it was Rocky Hills, forever branding the land Satan's Kingdom for such a great portrayal. Satan's Kingdom in New Hartford, Connecticut, is Satan's Kingdom with an apostrophe, so it was probably named as such after Massachusetts and Vermont, as the apostrophe suggests more regulated grammatical structure. Today, the area is a one-acre recreation area for whitewater rafting, but it used to include a rough and mountainous district in the eastern part of the town in the 1800s, a place where notorious outcasts and rogues would congregate. The robbers of the district were so well-known, urban legends claimed Satan claimed the people and the area as his own. When New Hartford's first minister, Mr. Jonathan Marsh, 1739-1794, settled in the town, a resident of Satan's kingdom was invited to his first sermon, where, in the course of his prayer, Mr. Marsh, among other things, prayed that Satan's kingdom might be destroyed. It appears that the inhabitant of this district took the expression in a literal and tangible sense, having probably never heard the expression used but in reference to the district where he resided. 
Being asked to go to the meeting in the afternoon, he refused, stating that Mr. Marsh had insulted him for blast him, said he, when he prayed for the destruction of Satan's kingdom. He very well knew all my interests lay there. When the area was vacated by its less than reputable inhabitants is unknown, but by the 1970s it was covered by a farm which was replaced to make way for the rafting facilities that currently exist there. The last, Satan's Kingdom, is the most mysterious and most popular. Well known for its semi-famous signpost, itself somewhat of a tourist trap, Satan's Kingdom is another unincorporated village located in the town of Northfield, Franklin County, in the north of Massachusetts. Massachusetts's Satan's Kingdom has perhaps the most disputed name origins of all. Some claim it shares its origins with Vermont's Satan's Kingdom, but the Massachusetts area does have fertile, if forested, soil. Others claim it is due to the town of Turner's Falls, 13 miles to the south, named for the massacre of Captain William Turner and his troops during King Philip's War. People say Satan's Kingdom retained the name in reference to the infamous ambush, a possible but unlikely origin due to the distance. Sam Lovejoy, manager of the wildlife management area of Satan's Kingdom, thinks it was named as such for the poisonous snakes in the woods, as he explained to the news here. Times, there's a lot of talk about there being poisonous snakes, that kind of danger, so nicknaming a place Satan's Kingdom was just to warn people, you know, to be careful when they're there. Love Northfield's boys, Satan's yeah. Kingdom, as all the Satan's Kingdoms, does have deeper roots in the area's folklore. It is probably more than just poisonous snakes that gave it its name. In his post, Strain's Massachusetts Place Names, Part 1, Satan's Kingdom, Nick DeLuca was able to turn up an article from Gill, Massachusetts's Village Post newspaper dated 1834. The article offers this explanation for the name. Satan's Kingdom. It is well known this appellation is given to a tract belonging to Northfield, lying on this, west side of the river. The origin of this name is this. Mr. Hubbard, formerly the minister of Northfield, was one day holding forth in an earnest manner before his people, and prayed that Satan's kingdom on earth might be destroyed. At the close of the meeting, the woods on the opposite side of the river were observed to be on fire, when a wag, a smart aleck, remarked that the good parson's prayer was being answered. Satan's kingdom was on fire. Since that time, the tract has sustained the name Satan's kingdom. Whether the land really belongs to old Nick or not, we are unable to say. But of this fact, we are sure that it is of good soil, and perhaps some of the most valuable farms in Northfield are situated in the tract. Hops are raised in vast quantities in the kingdom and the lower part of Vermont. Some landowners have devoted almost all their attention to the culture of this article, and great profits are said to occur from it. In the early part of September, the hops are gathered by a great number of hands, chiefly girls. It is by work while the day lasts, and at night, it is not uncommon, practice to have a merry wake. DeLuca offers his own alternative theory based on local legends. Supposedly, the pirate Captain Kidd, before he was arrested in Boston in 1699, sailed up the Connecticut River. Kidd and his crew reached the Massachusetts-Vermont border, where they buried treasure on a Clark's Island. The legend goes that the crew drew lots, and the loser was killed and buried with the treasure. The crewman's ghost would protect the loot until Kidd and his crew returned to claim it at a later date. Though, as Kidd was executed in London in 1701, nobody ever returned for the booty. Later in the 1800s, rumors asserted Massachusetts local Walbridge Abner Field, Massachusetts representative and later Chief Justice of the Massachusetts Supreme Court, went looking for the treasure one day with three friends. To find it, the treasure hunters consulted a noted conjurer of the state who enchanted them, giving them the power slash map to find Kidd's lost treasure. The only requirement for the spell being they searched for the treasure by moonlight, and none could speak until they retrieved it. One night then, Abner Field and his associates struck out to Clark's Island, but just as they were digging, one of the treasure hunters exclaimed, You've hit it! Then, as A History of the Town of Northfield describes what transpired, Alas, for that word the charm is broken, and instantly the chest settled down out of reach, and as instantly the disturbed ghost flitting around them, and before they can collect their scattered senses, Satan himself, full six feet tall, rises from under the bank, crosses the island like a wheel, going through a haystack, and plunges into the river with a yell and splash. Thus was the hope of the anxious months blasted. But the diggers ever after insisted, as they told their story to the eager group gathered of an evening before the blazing fire, that they struck the iron lid and might have been rich men, but for the unlucky exclamation, you've hit it. Though, even the book is a bit skeptical of Mr. Field and Associates' story, adding, some were malicious enough to say that the secret of the expedition was betrayed in advance, and that Oliver Smith and an accomplice were on hand to impersonate the ghost and the evil one, Satan. 
so maybe there's more than one reason each location is its own Satan's kingdom. As is clear by now, besides spontaneous fires and practical jokes, there is very little actually satanic about the three Satan's kingdoms, at least by how people would see them today. Their remoteness, former or modern, made them seem like a part of hell to the Puritans. While the actual danger, beside poisonous stakes, has passed, the taboo of the name still inspires fear and intrigue in people. The popularity of an amusing signpost attests to that. From the Indian-haunted wastelands of King Philip's War to the whitewater rafting of modern-day New England. While there have been efforts to change each location's name to something a little more appropriate for Christendom, governmental gridlock makes that less than likely. Plus, as by now, it's just tradition. A geographic tag left over from the days of the righteous Puritan Commonwealth. The inheritance of the Puritans is a complicated one, a unique influence on the American imagination. One thing they very much ingrained in the culture of the United States is a fear of the darkness, the fear of what wanders through the woods at midnight and within your own soul. A complex invested in American Gothic horror by Nathaniel Hawthorne and continued by all his successors to this very day. A unique concept of American fear, where fear itself becomes sinful. The maniac murderer chasing you through the woods with the hatchet is just the modern version of Lucifer dancing with witches in the backwoods of Massachusetts. If you want to, it is possible to visit all three Satan's kingdoms in one day. It's a trip of only about 198 miles, or four hours depending on traffic. It would be a nice tour of New England across Connecticut, Massachusetts, and Vermont. Take a nice Sunday stroll through Satan's kingdom. I just wouldn't go at night. Unless you're looking for Captain Kidd's treasure, of course. Now that we've gone through hell, I'd like to thank my patron, the single way out. 